We don't have a host. Who's going to host? <laughs> Tony, I think it's you up to you, host. Nathaniel. No, I could never host. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I'm here. I would never leave you guys. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Over the weekend, a bipartisan group of senators, 10 Republicans, and 10 Democrats announced that they had reached an agreement on new gun restrictions and funding for mental health services and school security. With conventional wisdom suggesting inaction was the most likely outcome, what made this agreement possible and will it actually become law? We also have some elections to catch up on and preview. Alaska held its primary to replace the late Congressman Don Young over the weekend. Votes are still being tallied in the largely mail ballot election, but so far, Sarah Palin is leading the pack. And four states are holding primaries this Tuesday, Nevada, Maine, North Dakota, and South Carolina. In Nevada, Republicans will choose a candidate to face off against Senator Catherine Cortez Masto in what is expected to be a key competitive race this fall. And in South Carolina, Trump's endorsement will once again be put to the test. Here with me to discuss is politics reporter Alex Samuels. Hey, Alex. Hey, Galen. Also here with us is elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Hey, Nathaniel. Hey, Galen. And not here with us is editor-in-chief Nate Silver. He was having technical difficulties this morning, so he will not be joining us. He is in Las Vegas. I hope he is enjoying all of the gambling. Let's dive right into it all. So the news on a gun safety compromise in the Senate broke over the weekend, and the package includes a grant program to encourage states to adopt red flag laws, background checks on gun buyers under 21 that include a search of juvenile justice and mental health records, a broadened ban on gun sales to convicted domestic abusers, as well as funding for mental health services and increased security in schools. So the conventional wisdom is that bipartisan legislation doesn't happen this close to an election for one, but also the safe bet over the past almost 30 years has been that any gun restriction will ultimately fail. To be determined if this will pass in the end, but Alex, why have they gotten this far, do you think? Um, I think one of the reasons they've gotten so far in this particular bill is that it's a lot narrower than the set of restrictions proposed by House Democrats. So as you mentioned, Galen, it focuses a lot on a mix of modest gun control proposals and funding for mental health. You know, they're not really looking to roll back, you know, specific restrictions on who can get a firearm. It really focuses a lot on the mental health aspect of this. And I think that's part of the reason why we've seen some luck with this bill so far, this legislation, compared to what we've seen in the House. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think that the difference here was that as opposed to something like voting rights or Build Back Better, you know, they didn't kind of start at a point of a very liberal Biden-supported plan, but rather kind of from the beginning, um, Democratic senators like Chris Murphy recognized if anything is going to pass, we're going to need Republican support. They went and directly talked to Republicans about what they would support. And they came out with this, you know, as Alex said, very kind of limited bill. You know, I, I think that it it shows how Democrats have to govern in a situation where their majority is so narrow and also a world in which the filibuster requires them to effectively get 60 votes for anything. Um, and it also goes to show how, um, how, how kind of hamstrung they are um, by those things because I think you know, nobody, I think even, um, you know, the people who, who negotiated this bill, I don't think anybody would say this is what they, they wanted to get or, you know, what a kind of comprehensive gun reform would look like, at least, you know, from the Democratic perspective. Um, but it is uh, what they can get. And as you mentioned, Gielan, it may not even be gettable because um, this hasn't passed yet. We don't know uh, if the votes are there. I don't even think the bill has been written yet, right? They've just kind of agreed on a framework. That's correct. So... To Nathaniel's yeah. point, uh, we could lose some of those 10 Republican senators as negotiations go on. Yeah, okay, so I guess that's worth asking. What's your baseline expectation at this point, given that they have a framework? Do you think that this becomes a you know written bill that ultimately passes both chambers? If I were to bet now, I would say yes. But <laughs> the reason I guess I'm hesitating is I was reading an NPR write-up of 
you know, this agreement over the weekend. And they basically said that some gun groups are already opposing the framework and they're criticizing the 10 Republicans who have backed it. And so if they're able to convince any one of them to back away from the deal, that could effectively kill the legislation if no other Republicans join Democrats to support the proposal. And since the bill hasn't been written yet, I think there's a general agreement on principles, but not since there's no bill text, you know, opinions can easily change. Yeah, I I really don't know the kind of optimistic side for the bill. You have the fact that um, none of these 10 Republicans are up for uh, a lecture or on the ballot this year. They're either retiring or they are up for election in a future year. Um, so they may be somewhat insulated from some of those electoral pressures like a, a primary challenge threat. But on the other hand, I, I do see, you know, it takes time to write a bill and it's already June. And if, you know, we run and start running into the congressional recess and things like that, and then people are starting to really focus on the elections. And as you mentioned, Galen, you know, this close to an election, it is hard to pass a bill. So I wouldn't be surprised to see something uh, or just kind of fall apart or lack of momentum. Um, There is also, of course, the fact that, you know, there is this public pressure right now in the immediate aftermath of the mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde to do something. Um, But we have seen and we've published articles on the site that, you know, the um, increased support and urgency for gun control um, tends to fade a couple of months after um, those mass shooting events. And therefore, if just kind of the normal legislative process, which does take time, that's, that's just what governing does. Um, if this drags into like an August, say, um, then that urgency may no longer be there. I mean, there's also the lame duck session. It's probably early to be talking about what's possible after, you know, the election in November. But are lame duck periods of Congress usually busy periods? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Galen. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the lame duck session. I remember, I'm old enough to remember um, the oh, lame duck she's session old enough to <laughs> in, uh, in 2010, after the 2010 election, um, which was kind of Democrats, the last gasp of the Democratic trifecta after, of course, Republicans took control of the House in the 2010 elections. And that was a very productive session. I believe that's when they ended uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. They passed uh, a major treaty with Russia. Um, and I think there was also like um, the Obama tax cuts, which never get talked about anymore. But um, it, it was very productive. And I part of me does wonder if not just on guns, actually, I think on guns by then, you know, that will have been hopefully, um, you know, what, six months removed from uh, from a major mass shooting. And that may no longer be at the top of the agenda. But I have kind of wondered, you know, could some of these, you know, retiring or defeated Republicans or Democrats, well, I guess Democrats are, are largely united and Manchin and Sinema aren't on the ballot this year. But um, you do wonder if the pressure of the lame duck situation and the fact that the election will be behind them could uh, spur some action on maybe like a slim down build back, build back better or something like that. For the gun uh, proposal, at least what I've read is that they have set an informal goal of passing uh, the bill before the Senate goes on break on June 24th. I don't know how feasible that is, but are you guys insinuating that like maybe it just gets kicked down the line or... I was just trying to understand that. I didn't realize that what they had sent set that deadline. That does seem ambitious to me, but I mean, maybe if they think it's possible, then then it won't stretch into in August. And if that happens, I definitely would say that the the chances of passage are higher. Um, but yeah, I also feel like you know, in any bureaucracy, you can you know, somebody says, "Oh, this is the Get deadline," the and you're like, "Okay, great," like you know, so it'll be the next week. Um, so yeah, for people who have been paying close attention to this current Congress and not maybe so keyed in on the general message that, oh, Democrats aren't getting any of their priorities done. It seems like there is a good number of bipartisan legislation that's getting passed. You know, of course, they passed a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. And a lot of that has been led by this sort of moderate, more centrist cohort you know, the Susan Collins's, Pat Toomey's, uh, Kirsten Cinemas, Joe Manchin's. I mean, looking at this Congress, of course, you know, the general message about American politics is that things are becoming more extreme. 
But is the center of power still the political center? Because it seems like they're the people who can actually get stuff done. Oh, yeah. 100%. That is no one wants to disagree with me on that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, second one. At least until a party has 60 votes in the Senate. Um, I think that is that is going to be the reality. Okay, well, then here's my follow-up question. Looking at that dynamic, wouldn't an ambitious politician think, if I want to have sway in government, if I want to bring home the bacon for my constituents, if I just want to be powerful and feel good about myself, wouldn't that draw people more towards the center? Like, Isn't there an incentive structure to get more sort of centrist minded or moderate, you know, whatever these terms are complicated, but people in office? Well, if you are not yet in office, you have to get through a primary. So that's a challenge, you know, and I think I think there is an incentive structure for somebody, you know, some random backbench senator right now to to say, yeah, like, you know, I'm going to go toward the center and, you know, be, you know, like, like a Joe Manchin and how much power he has. Um, But I also think that um, kind of being a a team player and, um, you know, maintaining good relationships within the party is also a strong incentive. Um, So I don't know. I mean, people probably look at um, Kirsten Sinema and how she has become really hated by uh, a lot of Democrats and, you know, potentially could lose a primary challenge. I think that is a fear for a lot of people. So as partisanship um, and polarization increase, like there there are advantages to being in the center, but the the disadvantages, I think, are, are also clearer where you are you will be branded as kind of a, uh, a turncoat more so than um, maybe you would have been in the past. You certainly see that on the Republican side. Um, you know, they treat people as, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill or voting for a January 6th commission, you know, it can be enough to, to lose you a primary. That's happened this year. Yeah, I'm cur- I mean, John Cornyn isn't up for election very soon, but Alex, I'm curious, as our Texas-based <laughs> politics reporter, what do you make of John Cornyn's role in this gun legislation? I mean, or at least framework for gun legislation, right? Texas is a, a very proud support as a state, you know, in general, very proud supporter of the Second Amendment. What is his incentive here? Cornyn has, I believe, an A-plus rating from the NRA and even still seem pretty eager to defend this package from any potential conservative pushback. It could be what Nathaniel said, the fact that he's not necessarily up for re-election this year. He has, you know, he has some fodder for if this bill is unpopular with Republicans to later make up for it um, in uh, future elections. But I'm not quite sure, I guess, why he's maybe the lead voice in Texas on this bill. So doesn't he want to be Senate Majority Leader uh, after McConnell? I feel like that is... Don't they all? Maybe, but I think he he is definitely positioning himself for that. For a view of the Senate, maybe from 20 years ago, it would seem obvious that like setting yourself up as like this ambassador for, you know, Right, a deal maker and like the leader of this group of ten Republicans um, is you know good for for showing that you have clout in the Senate, showing your your leadership abilities. Um, it, it is maybe interesting that Cornyn still maybe feels this way, given that you've also seen a lot of people who are like a lot of Republicans who are like working with Democrats is bad and you could just as easily see this kind of thing backfiring and and John Cornyn um, losing support because people are saying he's too quick to compromise and he's not kind of um, towing the line enough. I don't know what his personal motives are for this, um, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays if and when he runs for majority or minority leader. Right, of course, because it's the Republican caucus that's going to be deciding you know, minority or majority leader, not the Senate as a whole, of course. Who knows? You know, if you work in John Cornyn's Senate office and uh, you want him to come on this podcast and answer that question for himself, uh, email me or DM me or whatever. And we can we can talk to John Cornyn and maybe get an answer directly. Anyway, let's move on and talk about what we had previously planned on discussing this week, which is, of course, elections. 
About 50 candidates have been running to replace a longtime Alaska Congressman Don Young, including former Republican vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin and a city councilor from the North Pole named Santa Claus. The results of the primary held over the weekend are still coming in, but with about 30% of the expected vote counted, Palin leads with 30%. Fellow Republican Nick Begich, the third, is at 19%. Independent Al Gross is at 13%. And Democrat Mary Peltola is at 8%. Santa Claus is at 5%. All the candidates run on the same ballot, regardless of party, and the top four vote-getters will advance to the general election, which will be determined by rank choice voting. So, Nathaniel, I know you have been paying a lot of attention to this race. Do we think these early returns will be representative of the final results when we get them? Um, yeah, I think they're pretty close. You know, the first, the top three candidates seem to have pretty solid leads. Uh, so it seems quite likely that they will advance to the general election. Um, the number four spot seems to be where there's some question. And so, as you mentioned right now, uh, Democrat Mary Peltola has the fourth spot. Um, but Republican Tara Sweeney is uh, just two points behind her. And you could definitely see the, um, kind of those two switching spots, um, considering that about half the vote still has yet to be counted. What about Santa Claus? Is there still a still a case for uh, Santa Claus to be made? As Twitter user Populism Updates uh, said uh, in response to the results, it would probably take a Christmas miracle for Santa to to come back. Um, but I suppose you never know. He is only um, like about three points behind. So uh, so maybe. Do you believe in miracles? <laughs> No, that's a serious question. I want, I, want, I want the two of you to answer, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> um, do, can we tell from this primary, you know, who is best positioned to win a ranked choice voting election in the general? I mean, you might look at the results and think Sarah Palin has 30%. All she needs is another 20% plus one, and she's got it. But ranked choice voting can be a little more complicated than that. Is there any tea leaves you can read here? I mean, with the top four system, I mean, it's plausible that Alaskans back a more moderate Republican versus someone like Palin. If Palin is the lone Republican running against a Democrat after two rounds of vote reallocations, she'll probably win because of how red Alaska is. But if she's up against a more moderate Republican in the final round, then hypothetically, you know, couldn't Democrats, moderate Republicans and independents team up against her? Yeah, like, and I think the prime example of who that person would be is Nick Bagich. You know, right now, if who, who do you think is the favorite, Nick Bagich or Sarah Palin? I would vote on Begich. Mm. Don't, don't, my read, readers don't like hate me if I'm wrong. Don't e send me mean emails. But I mean, the new voting system essentially gives ca like candidates, they have this incentive to appeal to the broadest possible constituency in both parties rather than their own like narrow set of core supporters. So that being said, a Trump endorsement might hurt Palin in a state like Alaska. And that might bode what bode better for a candidate like Begich. Yeah, it's interesting because this, I think, is a, a prime example of a situation where ranked choice voting might actually change who wins, uh, which it actually normally does not do because a lot of the, the reasons that candidates run to the right or to the left um, isn't necessarily because of our election system. It's just because that's what voters want to hear. Um, that's an important caveat, I think, to this whole thing. But in Alaska... And based on these results, I mean, clearly, if you had kind of a traditional Republican primary, Sarah Palin would have finished first. Um, she would have advanced to the general election. Most likely, you know, she's 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 quite unpopular. She has, I think, a like a 59 percent negative rating and only like a 36 percent positive rating. Yep. Um, in Alaska. In the state, according wow. Right, in, in Alaska. Um, even this is, of course, a, a red state, not like a deeply red state. It's not like Alabama. But um, but that is certainly notable, uh, notably bad for a Republican in Alaska. But despite that, because of partisanship, because of the fact that this is a Republican-leaning year, I would have to say that she would have been strongly favored to have defeated whoever the Democratic nominee was. Um, but under this ranked choice voting system, you have a situation where, as, as Alex mentioned, once the lower-tier candidates are eliminated— um, 
chances are that you know Democrats or moderate you know independents are going to be ranking someone like Palin last or toward the bottom. Um, so you would expect someone like Begic to accumulate votes at a faster pace than she would. So are, would you also put your money on Begic? I would, yeah. Um, you know, polls that tried to simulate the ranked choice um, election before the primary um, all said that Begich would win. I think that Palin, well, I want to be careful. So right now, I think Palin's doing a little bit better in the primary um, than than what was expected. Um, but because half of the vote is not yet counted, that could definitely change. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, to answer your original question, Galen, I think that the primary can show us tea leaves because if someone like Palin had gotten 45% in the first round, that's only 5% away from a majority. That's something that you really, like you can probably snag that 5% away, even from, you know, there are some, maybe some strange, uh, you know, Al Gross number one, Sarah Palin number two voters. But when right now in the, in the, results, uh, Begich is only 10 points behind Palin. That feels um, like it is make upable. Is there a world, sorry, this might be my ignorance speaking, but is there a world in which, you know, Alaskans maybe don't know all 48 candidates didn't care to read all of their platforms, but they at least know Sarah Palin's name. So maybe they rank her second or third just by virtue of knowing who she is. And she, you know, gets votes because of that. And that can help her candidacy is that a possibility as well i mean i think i think it's a challenge because she's not the kind of person who has like high name id but like low understanding of what that name id is people know her because they actually know her politics and they have an opinion about her and so it's like okay hillary clinton has 100 percent name id amongst republicans in america but they're not just going to like pick her off of a list because they recognize the name, like they know her and they know that they don't like her. Um, and I guess given what Rakich said about her favorability ratings in the state, Palin, not Clinton, uh, it would seem to me like it's less likely that people would just say, oh, I recognize that last name. Or like, I, we had a senator like 20 years ago with a similar last name or something like that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that in a situation where like the ranked choice election had been with all 48 candidates, that would have been true. People obviously wouldn't have taken the time to rank all 48 candidates and put Sarah Palin down at 48th or whatever. Um, they might have, you know. But you can also just not rank people in a ranked choice election. Right. Um, yes. And, and that's probably what would have happened. But I think the the benefit of this system, which it should be noted, is being tried for the first time in the United States with this election. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see whether it, it kind of, you know, delivers as intended, um, is that by making it, making kind of having this primary that sets a threshold where only the first four candidates advance to the general, it kind of ensures that people have a limited list of people to look at and they can take a look at, you know, a reasonable number of candidates and compare their platforms and say, you know, yeah. So basically, like, I think that by the general election, especially in a special election where, um, you know, turnout is likely to be low and um, maybe the voters are going to be more informed. People who are voting will know who Al Gross and, and probably even the number four candidate, whoever that ends up being, they'll take the time to, to study them up and decide whether they want to put that person before or after Palin. Yeah, contrast that to the New York mayoral election where I think people felt a little overwhelmed by their choices even in the, well, in the, in the Democratic primary, which is basically the general election in New York. And on that point, from a good governance perspective, does this seem like a good voting system? You said, we'll see if it delivers as intended. Like, what is the intention that we should be judging its performance on? I think that a ranked choice system, you know, the, the primary goal is to make sure that the person who wins is acceptable to a majority of people. And I think that kind of what goes along with that is like, you know, the reformers often hope that it'll be someone more moderate um, and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not sure. The, the results have been quite mixed. Uh, I think that's still largely a, a, an aspirational hope that, that you know, a ranked choice system will elect someone more moderate. As I mentioned, voters themselves are just quite polarized and and are not all that interested in moderates. Um, but in terms of again, kind of getting someone in the majority uh, who, who a majority can kind of get behind, um, I think it, yeah, I think it's, it's promising. Um, 
the issue will be, as you kind of mentioned, Galen, whether people kind of use the the rank choice, the full slate. Um, I know in New York, there were a lot of people who just voted for one candidate or two candidates and then left the rest blank. And that can kind of create a situation where um, you could maybe see a situation where the Democrats, instead of ranking Begich, the you know non-Tea Party Republican, um, third, they just don't vote for anybody. Maybe they'll do, you know, Mary Peltola, the Democrat, and then Al Gross, the like liberal independent second, and then don't vote for anybody else. And in that case, those votes will get thrown out. And, and uh, if assuming those two candidates get eliminated and Begich won't benefit from them, and then maybe Palin wins that way. Um, so that will be something to watch out for. Kind of basically a, a good test is whether a majority of all the ballots cast uh, go like eventually vote for the winner. I think in in New York, right, Galen, you would know this better than me, but like when you like in the final round between Eric Adams and Catherine Garcia, Adams got a majority of the votes that had bothered to rank all of those candidates. But of the total votes, I think Adams only got like 40 percent or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it yeah. can get tricky if people don't fill out their full ballots. Right. And one of the criticisms of ranked choice voting is that it's kind of like highly tuned in, maybe more educated and wealthier voters fill out the full ballot. And younger people, uh, lower income people, communities of color don't necessarily fill out the full ballot to sort of take advantage of the options that ranked choice voting allows. Yeah, there's been some, uh, there have been some studies that suggest that it decreases turnout because it's a kind of a more complicated ballot, or at least it's something that you need to get used to. I think the jury is still very much out on that. Um, and it'll also be very difficult to measure that in Alaska, given that it's a special election. We'll have maybe a better indicator in um, in the real November election. Um, but uh, that would also be, I think, something to look at as to whether the policy or the, um, the election reform has been successful or not. Okay. Well, of course, we will be watching the final results of this primary and then the general election. And this same voting system is going to be used in the regularly scheduled Senate election this year. So we will see if it keeps Lisa Murkowski in the Senate or not. I think that's been her bet so far. But let's talk about the election still to come this week. Maine, Nevada, North Dakota, and South Carolina are all holding their primaries on Tuesday. We aren't expecting any competitive races in Maine or North Dakota, so today we're going to focus on Nevada and South Carolina. There's also a another special election in Texas's 34th congressional district following the resignation of Democratic Representative Philomene Vela, which could tell us something about the broader electoral environment because, of course, it pits a Republican against a Democrat in a relatively competitive seat. But let's begin with Nevada because... I don't know if listeners remember, but towards the beginning of the year, when we talked about some of the most significant Senate races this fall, I think if Nate was here, he could confirm or not. I think Nate might have said that he considered Nevada to be like one of the most important races or one of the most significant races in determining who ultimately controls the Senate. And what we're going to find out this week is who will face off against Democratic incumbent Catherine Cortez Masto. What does that Republican primary look like, Nathan? So the front runner is former state attorney general Adam Laxalt. He's got Trump's endorsement. He's got the Club for Growth's endorsement. Those are two obviously very influential Republican figures. Um, but uh, I do think we should mention um, there's been a, a very strong grassroots campaign by um, this guy, Army veteran Sam Brown, who um, has been, you know, just – he, he has a very kind of compelling life story. He's a, apparently a very dynamic campaigner. Um, he has been, you know, kind of throwing conservative red meat uh, to voters. Same as Laxalt. Laxalt is plenty conservative. It's not like this is kind of a moderate um, versus a conservative type of thing. Um, but uh, Laxalt does kind of have the, you know, the establishment taint in that he his family name is big in Nevada. His grandfather was a senator and a governor. Um, and this guy, Sam Brown, is, is kind of an, an outsider's outsider, um, you know, I think is the way that that he would put it. Um, so he's made the race competitive. It still looks like Laxalt has a double digit lead in the polling, but you never know. Primary polling can be uh, fickle. You know, there can be lots of voters changing their mind at the last minute. Um, so it's still one to watch. Piggybacking off of what Nathaniel said, um, what I've read is that, you know, 
to your point, Brown is pitching himself as this kind of political outsider. He's even attacked Club for Growth for getting involved in the race and essentially said that, you know, DC PACs are trying to influence the race. Nevadans' votes are not for sale, et cetera, et cetera. And that he has a strong grassroots army uh, ready to vote for him. And he is outpacing Laxalt in small dollar donations, if uh, I understand that correctly too, which means he's been able to go up on TV. Um, His name ID has increased a bit. And I think, uh, you know, he might have an appeal to some Republican voters as this new guy whose strength against a Democrat in a statewide race hasn't been tested yet. And that might be enough to make the race, you know, competitive at the very least. But as Nathaniel mentioned, he's still trailing Laxalt in most, if not all public polls that have been released recently. Of course, the reason we're focused on this primary is because of the significance of Nevada in the fall. Do we have any early general election polling? Like, how clear is the picture of Cortez Masto's vulnerability? We do not have a lot of great polls. So the most recent poll is from the University of Nevada. Um, It was among all adults, which is not what you want to do when you're doing an election poll, but it actually gave Masto a large lead, uh, 20 points or so, which I do not believe, quite frankly. Um, The poll before that was a partisan Republican poll done by McLaughlin and and Associates, which does not have the best track record. That had uh, Laxalt leading by one point, um, which of course is within the margin of error. Um, But that is more close to to what I would expect. I, I think that this is a race where you should look at the fundamentals First, at this point, you know, I'm sure we'll get more polls of Nevada um, during the fall. And at that point, maybe we can pay a little bit closer attention to them. But um, look, I mean, Nevada is a very close swing state, um, maybe a couple points more Republican than the nation as a whole. And it is going to be a Republican leaning year. Masto is a you know, she's a capable incumbent, um, but I'm not sure she is the kind of juggernaut that Raphael Warnock and Mark Kelly are in uh, Georgia and Arizona, which, um, you know, especially with regard to fundraising, um, those states are a bit redder, but but those candidates might be a little bit stronger for Democrats. Um, so, and you also, you know, at least in um, Georgia, have a candidate who is not very battle-tested for Republicans uh, in Herschel Walker, whereas... Laxalt, if he were to win the primary, you know, he is a, he has previously been elected statewide. You know, he did lose a, the gubernatorial race in 2018, but um, that was a blue year. So I'm not sure that I would necessarily hold that against him. You know, Democrats kind of took a risk in redistricting Nevada this year and basically broke up a reliably blue seat, moved Democratic voters into other more competitive districts giving a lot of those districts only slight Democratic advantages. Given where the overall national environment looks today, like, are you thinking that Nevada is a prime pickup opportunity for Republicans this fall because of the way that Democrats actually gerrymandered? Yeah, I think they're actually Republicans have a decent shot at going for NO in Nevada, um, which would obviously mean that the Democratic gerrymander has backfired. Um, the bluest district now, I believe, is just D plus five, is the the fourth district, Stephen Horsford's district. And he um, has uh, have some kind of personal baggage in that he uh, had an affair. Um, so he may not be the strongest incumbent either. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I would not be surprised if uh, Republicans pick up three seats in Nevada, which three out of their four seats, which is uh, obviously pretty bad for Democrats. So maybe some indication of how that how likely that is to happen is what the national environment looks like overall. One of the things that we use to judge the national environment is special elections. And we've got one this week in Texas in the 34th congressional district. What is the partisan lean there, Alex? Like how how good of a representation of what a competitive race between Republicans and Democrats is this? So this is kind of a hard race to watch um, because the special election that's taking place tomorrow will take place under the more competitive district lines of the 34th district, which I believe has a partisan lean of D5. So that gives Republicans maybe more of an edge in this race than they will have in November. The November race, meanwhile, will uh, be under new district boundaries that are more favorable to Democrats, and that will have a 
partisan lean of D17. So of course, Republicans are making a play for this district, just like they're making a play for South Texas in general. And there's a lot working in their favor for this specific election, which will just finish the rest of Vela's truncated term, which again, will end in January. But it's still kind of a toss up whether they can hold on to the seat for Vela's full term. Um, in November, uh, Flores, Myra Flores, a Republican, she will be on the ballot again. But the Democrat she's running against will be Vicente Gonzalez, who is a incumbent politician. He just switched districts. So she has a more formidable challenger there. And I think that will make it harder for Republicans to ultimately keep the seat. And that's assuming that they perform well or overperform tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, you're almost talking as if it's a uh, foregone conclusion that Republicans are going to win in this D plus five seat this week. I mean, do you feel that way? Does it seem like Republicans are the favorite? I think it'll be competitive. I I will not say that, but, you know, Republicans have this in the bag. Um, what's working in Flores is favor. You know, she has the backing of Governor Abbott, the Congressional Leadership Fund. Again, the district lines D, D plus five makes it easier for a Republican to maybe overperform. This race could also go to a runoff. There are two other lesser known candidates on the ballot as well. So that makes it kind of tricky. Um, but on the Democratic side, uh, national Democrats haven't really gotten involved in this race so far. And their reasoning has been because they think they will sail through the November election. They're not really putting a ton of resources into this race. I think the DCCC didn't get involved um, in helping the lead Democrat in the race, Dan Sanchez, until pretty recently. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that Republicans will win this seat, but I think they definitely have a lot working in their favor to the point where I would bet that this race would go to a runoff between Flores and Sanchez. Okay. So the DCCC is not getting heavily involved, maybe making it known that they're not getting heavily involved. You would still think that Democrats wouldn't want to run against an incumbent in the fall, an incumbent Republican, if they had their choice. Um, which makes me think, and you guys correct me if my thinking here is wrong, is that like Democrats basically thought they were going to lose this district anyway, want to publicize the fact that they're not trying very hard so they don't look all that bad when they lose it. Because from the perspective of November's politics, like they don't want to run against an incumbent. Agree or disagree? I agree with that. I also think that if they had put a big effort into this, this would kind of come to be seen as, you know, the next Georgia 6th, which if people remember Literally from back me. in 2017 was seen as this big proxy fight um, where it was going to tell us whether, you know, Democrats or, or Republicans had the momentum in the, you know, the first major election of the Trump era and Republicans ended up winning narrowly and it didn't end up being all of that um all that predictive, although it it, sh it did show a kind of a shift toward Democrats. They just didn't shift all the way in, in order to win. Um, but of course, they ended up picking the, up the seat in the 2018 regular general election anyway. Um, but I think that if Democrats had gotten heavily involved in this Texas race, you would have seen a lot of coverage of it. You would have seen big pronouncements at the end when the Republican or the Democrat, probably the Republican, in my opinion. Well, I don't know. Now, if they had put in more of an effort, it would be, I think, more of a toss up as it is. I think the Republicans are probably going to win. Yeah, Democrats would have run the risk of having these bad headlines about how a red wave was building and stuff like that. And I think they wanted to avoid that. Quick trivia question. How much money was spent in Georgia's sixth in 2017, the special election? Oh, God. I knew this at one point. It was a lot. It was like more than any other like house race in 2016 or something like that. Uh, let me say 20 million. Alex? Can I just throw out a random number? Uh, yeah, that's what Nathaniel did. <laughs> uh, 28 million? Alex, you got it, but you're still pretty far off. Okay. 55 <laughs> effing million dollars wow, in yeah. Georgia 6. You know what that got? That got John Ossoff a Senate seat. It's true. We should do more trivia on this podcast. We, we should do more trivia on this <laughs> podcast. All right. Well, let's move on to our final races or state of the day. And of course, we are going to have a podcast later in the week rehashing the results once we have them and digging into the nitty gritty a little bit more. But- for now, let's wrap on South Carolina. And in that state, Trump has endorsed against two incumbent Republican congressional representatives, 
ranging from seriously Trump skeptical to anti-Trump to the point of voting for his impeachment in 2021. Those two representatives are Nancy Mace and Tom Rice. Nancy Mace is, you know, I would say Trump skeptical, but didn't ultimately vote for his impeachment. Tom Rice voted for his impeachment, which was kind of a shock at the time. Uh, And now Trump has endorsed against both, unsurprisingly. At this point, how serious do these Trump-endorsed challengers look, Alex? Pretty serious. I would say if I were Nancy Mace, if I had to choose between being Nancy Mace or Tom Rice, I would lean toward being Nancy Mace. I think she has a better chance, a better chance of reelection. Um, part of the reason why is that she's kind of backpedaled on any anti-Trump sentiment. She also uh, filmed a video in front of Trump Tower recently where she basically like ticked off all of her Trump credentials and whatnot. And I believe there was a non-internal poll of the race um, that gave Mace uh, 46% compared to her challenger, Arrington, getting 41%. Um, A little wrinkle in that is that 13% of the first district voters were still undecided, which could be problematic for for Mace as we get closer uh, to tomorrow and have election day voting. Um, But... On the other side, you know, I would say the biggest thing working against Rice right now and arguably why he might have a harder time getting reelected than Mace is because he's continued to double down on his impeachment vote. And he said publicly that he's willing to stake his political career on that vote. Whereas Mace has more like said, I disagree. I agree with Trump's policies, but there are certain things that he's said and that he's done that I disagree with. So I think it'll be just an interesting case of how voters weigh like pro-Trumpism in the GOP and whether they want to keep May selected. Yeah, just how Trump skeptical can you be? Also, maybe a test of, 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 you know, the role that money plays. I think Nancy Mace is a pretty aggressive fundraiser. She's raised about $4 million. She spent a lot of time on Fox, you know, like she, she's not, stake in her political career on anti-Trumpism. She wants to get reelected. Not that Tom Rice doesn't want to get reelected, but. Yeah, but it's it's interesting though, um, in both of these races, I mean, particularly in the Mace race, is there a path to run as a conservative who's loyal to Trump's policies, but also keeping a distance from or even outright criticizing some of his actions? And the answer might be yes, might be no. I mean, polls so far show that Mace is ahead, so. Maybe there is a path for Republicans who want to do that. Yeah, I mean, the question is, what is kind of the the standard desired outcome? I think that a lot of Republicans would rather just coast to victory in their primaries with 80% rather than have to kind of fight for it. And that's why you see a lot of them just go go along with Trump to the hilt. Um, I agree that someone like Mace can is showing uh, if she wins, which I think she has a a decent shot of. if she wins, I think she will show that you can criticize Trump, break with him sometimes, but still, if you don't go all the way and you know commit kind of one of these unforgivable sins like voting to impeach him, um, then you can survive. But um, it's still, nobody wants to have kind of a close political call like that. All right, well, we will see what happens Tuesday night, and I look forward to chatting again once we have the answer to the question that we've just posed. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Chadwick Matlin is our editorial director. And Emily Vineski is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.